Churches Conservation Trust is the national charity for churches at risk. We look after 360 churches vested in us by the Church of England and when they come to us often they've been neglected or have some form of damage to them and we repair them. Church buildings tend to be the centre of a village or a town or a community. They tell the history of the local community, so it's really important that we keep these buildings standing and maintained really well so that people can enjoy them now and in the future. So an annual maintenance visit, we have two that happen every year. Each church in our estate is visited by our maintenance contractors. We do annual maintenance visits whereby we will check the gutters, clear the gullies, maintain what they call the cordon sanitaire, which is the metre band around the footprint of the church. We'll check the slates, clean the gutters high level, so all the lead work, replace where we can any of the slates that are broken, report back any defects to the office, anything that is can be detrimental to the welfare of the building can be highlighted. It's really important to maintenance because the main thing is to make sure that our churches are happy and healthy. The main thing is to keep water out of the buildings and so looking after the rainwater goes, looking after the drainage, although it's not that glamorous, it's really, really important because when things go wrong, they can go dramatically wrong and letting water into the building is something that we don't want. As with all the churches that we look after, there are varying degrees of work needing to be done, some more serious than others. We try and do what we can, where we can, but it's never a simple case of being able to walk away and then being good for the next five years. The next maintenance visit will always show something else that needs attention. We practice a stitching time maintenance. This means that if we just replace a slip slate as soon as possible, the water doesn't pour through the fabric and rot the roof structure. So this will save us costs and it will also mean that more of the ancient fabric is able to be saved. The CCT is just here trying to save these buildings. We rely on the generosity of the communities through both time and donations and their support can help these buildings continue for generations to come. Before the vesting, the church didn't look like this. And whenever I come in, actually, it makes me smile because it is now so beautiful and bright. And where there was damp, it's all gone. It's been eradicated. Where there were bits of plaster about to fall off the walls, I don't stand at the front in fear that something will fall off on someone's head any longer. Everything just sings, really, to the beauty of the church. So it's quite changed. If churches are vested in the CCT, where they have been closed for regular public worship by the Church of England, but are of such a quality, architecturally, historically or archaeologically, that um, they are, if you like, too good for a new use to be introduced in, into them. Criteria in the legislation is, is that they are of such importance to the nation and the Church of England that they should be preserved um, by, by the CCT. The Church in the Field was vested in the CCT, I think, for three main reasons. Firstly, its historic significance. It was built um, in roughly 1668, which was a period when the building of churches in England was rare. We'd come through the Commonwealth period and the restoration of the monarchy had just taken place. And uh, in that period, be immediately beforehand, uh, there hadn't been many churches built. Um, secondly, described um, by Pevsner, as one of the most instructive cases of early Gothicism in England. 
Uh, so architecturally it's significant as a fine but small scale version of a perpendicular Gothic church. And, and as such, thirdly, it has a fine set of late, late 17th century furnishings uh, in, in the Edwardian tradition. So I've been working with Adrian Browning for the last year. We've been liaising about the different issues for this church. So um, looking at the parish, uh, looking at their capacity, um, how much they love the church, but mainly looking at the repair, because I'm here to find out what the costs and, and the different repairs that we might need to do to this church. My role in the, in the vesting of the, of the church in the field has been to oversee the work from inception to completion really. So it's starting with inspections of the various aspects of the building, um, understanding its nature, its materials and its, its repair needs um, to specify what needs to be done. Um, and then to uh, oversee the commissioning of specialist contractors and subcontractors to make sure the repair works undertaken in the right way. really important to work with specialists like Simon Boyd. Um, we couldn't not, we just couldn't achieve a, a really high quality repair without having um, a clock maker, without having a stonemason, without having a, a specialist glazier, you know, all of these, these skills. Um, I mean, Somerset and Devon and Dorset uh, just have the most fantastic craftspeople in them. And uh, in order to do the best for the church, we have to use these traditional craft skills that were used to build the church 500 years ago. During the vesting process, a lot of local people did actually express much more of an interest in the church and particularly when the work was going on, the physical work on the building. I do think the Church's Conservation Trust has done an absolutely splendid job here. You only have to look around to see how much has been achieved. I think the Church Conservation Trust has done an amazing job. Uh, I said we are very privileged that they took this on, so we did, we did appreciate there was a lot of other churches that needed needed help as well as we did. Um, the church you know, may have had to have been closed if we couldn't have had a CCT, simply because it's on private land and therefore makes it more difficult um, for general public to visit if it's not a safe building and it's now being made safe and being made a place where people feel very comfortable. Yeah. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to another Thursday lunchtime lecture. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you joining already. I see we've got just over 400 people joining us live. You are all most, most welcome. If this is the very first time that you are joining one of our lunchtime lectures, again, a warm welcome to you. Um, one of the things I should say is that if you are joining us for the first time, um, I'm just going to share my screen with you, it's just so you've got a couple of instructions for how these lectures work. Now, you can only watch our lunchtime lectures live on Facebook. You can't watch them anywhere else. So if you do see anybody commenting any links to tell, which say you can watch it elsewhere on an external website, 
please don't click those links. Um, you can only watch it on our website. Now, the easiest way for you to um, get a notification um, and for you to join our live streams is to make sure that you like and follow our main CCT Facebook account. Now, we've created some videos. Um, they are in the link to this film. So um, after you've watched this lecture, do have a look at that and watch one of our videos. And that shows you and does a step-by-step -step guide for how to like and follow our accounts. But if you've got any questions, just send us a message. Now, one of the best things about these lectures is that at the end of the talk, there is plenty of time for you to ask our lecturer questions. So please do comment away throughout the lecture. We'll um, collect your questions and we will put those to um, Sheldon at the end of the lecture. Now, if you like these lectures, please do hit that like button, share these lectures with your friends and do invite your friends and family um, to these lectures. Um, the more the merrier. And it's really great to see them um, that they've proved so popular. But in return, please do also consider making a donation to um, help us in caring for historic churches across the country. Um, you can do that by texting. Um, you can text um, CCT to 70331, and that will give us a gift of three pounds. But if you think our lectures are worth more than three pounds, why not consider giving us a gift of 10 pounds? And you can do that by texting again, CCT to 70, um, 70191, and that will give us a gift of 10 pounds. Now, in addition to that, you can donate securely through our website, but you can also um, join us as a member. Now, if you join us as a member by direct debit from as little as just £3.50 a month, um, we will be sending all of our new members a copy of Beautiful Churches, um, which have been saved by us, and that was written by Matthew Byrne. Um, I know a lot of people have already taken up on this offer, and it's been great to see so many people signing up as members and joining us in caring for historic churches. So it'd be lovely to see and lovely to welcome more new members. But I'm gonna pass you over to Peter Rez now. But so if you've got any questions, any problems with the lecture or the live stream you can't get in, just hit that direct message button and one of us will be on hand to help you. But over to you, Peter. Hi there, everybody, and thanks again for joining us for another lunchtime lecture. It's so and so heartening to see you all come in from across the world. A, a special welcome to all those who've joined us from the United States. I thought you might be a bit busy today uh, with everything that's going on there, but but really glad to have you you with us. Uh, right across Europe as well, there's lots of people with us in St Lucia as well. So great, and across England and also the home countries of. Of, uh, of the United Kingdom. So really, really glad to have you here uh, with us today. As you join us, uh, England has now gone into lockdown for, for a month, which means that we have a serious consideration about what we do about our churches at the Churches Conservation Trust. Uh, we've been thinking about this very carefully, but we've taken the decision that it, there, is a, there is scope within the legislation for our churches to be available for um, uh, independent prayer, as it's called. So uh, do check our website if you want to undertake going to one of our churches for independent prayer. You'll be able to see uh, where, where we can have sites open or not. They won't all be open, but we're trying to keep as, as many as, uh, available to people as possible, uh, which I think will be important in these difficult times that we're still all going through across the world. Um, just in case you've not come across us before, we're the Church's Conservation Trust. We were set up about 50 years ago uh, to tackle the issue of historic churches which no longer had a congregation for regular worship to look after them. We've collected 356 right across England. For all those viewers across England, you're never very far from a CCT church, so check out the map uh, that's there. Um, we, uh, we, we are sort of combination of, of the Church of England and, and the government who are, so help us support these buildings, but we need a lot of independent income as well, which we raise ourselves. So we effectively double the statutory money that we get every year. Uh, and this year has been particularly tough. I know it's been very hard for a lot of people and a lot of charities, a lot of businesses, a lot of individuals. Uh, and that's been, uh, we haven't escaped from that either. Uh, we've got a very large hole, just over half a million pounds in our income this year, which affects our ability to uh, undertake our work of protecting these fantastic historic buildings. But the good news is that you're all out there. So I reckon there's about just over 500 of you now. So if you all join up as a member for £3.50 a month, it's not much. You can help us really protect those historic buildings and uh, you can donate as well. And we'd be very, very grateful to, to any, anything you could give to us to help support our work, to make sure that these buildings survive the generations. Now, obviously, churches in, in England, they're, they're usually surrounded by a churchyard. 
uh, and sometimes they sit in cemeteries. Some of our churches, where the original parish church was, are actually uh, municipal cem cer uh, um, cemeteries have been put around them, particularly one in, in Essex I can think of. And uh, they're important as well, not only as open spaces for you to visit very easily during these social distance times, uh, but they contain a plethora of information and knowledge about the people who've come first. The churches are so important uh, to tell us a story of the place that they are. And they tell a story of everybody from the wealthiest to the poorest. It doesn't matter who you are, what you believe, what your sexuality is, where you come from. This building actually has something of your story in it. And I think that's fantastic. And today we have Sheldon Goodman, who's the curator of Cemetery Club, which um, a great name for his blog. Um, and he's obviously very passionate about telling the story about cemeteries and how you can learn from the from these places, which is fantastic. So he reframes actually cemeteries as the museums of the people. Of people, sorry, I said the people, but I suppose that's a, the people as well. Uh, he's just recently completed his master's at Birkbeck University in public histories and runs a number of tours. Well, he probably did till yesterday. He runs a number of tours in cemeteries, including queer histories of Brompton and Arnest Vale cemeteries. And he's also a qualified City of Westminster tour guide. So do check him out when we come out of lockdown, because I'm sure he'll um, want to give you a tour of, uh, of a cemetery. Now, he might try and pass off that he's in a catacomb in Paris to you, but I know really well that he's actually in Beckenham. But never mind. Without further ado, let me hand over to Sheldon and thank you again for joining us. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, as, as I had that wonderful introduction just then, yeah, my name's Sheldon and I run a blog called Cemetery Club. And hopefully over this next 40, 45 minutes with about 15 minutes for questions and stuff, it's going to take your mind off of the craziness of what's going on in the outside world right now. So uh, ignore the election, ignore coronavirus. Let's just kind of, you know, zone out and talk about the jolly subject of cemeteries. Now, particularly with my interest in cemeteries, um, I adore them and it's kind of very much the uh, reason of, well basically the reason of my being, but before we get into that I'll just give you like a brief uh, re reintroduction as to who I am. Um, I'm Sheldon Goodman and I run Cemetery Club, I'm on all the social medias as everyone is nowadays, but primarily on Twitter and then my own website which is Cemetery Club and then cemeteryclub.co.uk. As I heard before, I'm a City of Westminster tour guide. I've been a blogger since May 2013, which is when my passion for cemeteries really did kind of come to the fore. Um, it was a way to basically pass the time when I wasn't working, you know, just have a bit of a jolly stroll around a cemetery or churchyard and see what stories and um, headstones I could find of note. Um, Sheldon, I'm... you just might want to, I'm not sure if you're meant to be sharing your screen at the moment. Oh, right, hang on. Whoops, hold up. Hang on, what's going on here? Hang on. Are we good? Um, now, if you come out of it and go back in, because it's uh, not sharing at the moment. Oh, hello. Hang on. Uh, yeah. How's that? Brilliant. Good stuff. Right. Slides out to call it. It's fine. It's fine. So, yeah. So, just to go over who I am, um, Sheldon K. Goodman, as you heard in the introduction, I run Cemetery Club, cemeteryclub.co.uk. City of Westminster tour guide, blogger since 2013, cemetery enthusiast slash botherer. <laughs> um, I, as I said, you know, I, I love doing it. Tours include, as you've heard, Wonder Women of Hampstead Cemetery, Cockney Heroes and Villains of Tower Hamlet Cemetery, Graves in the Wood, um, Barn Cemetery, Queerly Departed and Drop Dead Gorgeous, which primarily looks at the queer histories of cemeteries and those uh, buried within them, which is a first for the, uh, the UK hasn't really been like a proper um, developed tour up until that which happened uh, earlier this year and last year as well at Brompton and Arnold's Fails respectively and then obviously I'm on Instagram as well right that's that now my journey why um, why am I so fanatical about looking at headstones and trying to find out the histories of those who are buried beneath them um, I find cemeteries are culturally and socially important but I don't think enough people now I dare say I'm probably preaching that's converted here because you're actually on this talk with us today, um, looking about how we can kind of extrapolate and learn more from these histories. But I find that they are superb, wonderful places to just jump off and find out something about the past. You know, it's all very well going to archives. It's all very good looking at like old newspapers and books and so on. But literally just, you know, go to a random cemetery, rock up with your phone or whatever, and just have a look at the headstones and just start Googling names and see what you kind of uh, come across. 
and you will find it's a brilliant way to kind of take your mind off things and to a great way to kind of while away the hours, you know, while you're trying to just distract yourself from something. Um, now, that's not to say that cemeteries are, again, preaching to the converted. I'm sure we all know their worth and their value, but a lot of people are put off by them. They find spooky or scary places. And what I try to do is say, look, you know, cemeteries are a part of life as much as the maternity ward. The stories that are within them are our stories. You know, our, our ancestors, our grandparents, our great grandparents are all buried in them. And those, you know, th these are people who lived and laughed, loved, cried. They've done all the stuff that we've done, might be sl wearing slightly different clothes and living in a slightly different era. But we can learn so much from those people that are buried beneath us. And that's what I try to impart when I'm doing, you know, social media or tours or blogs or whatever. There's nothing to fear, particularly. This is something, you know, we are part of a chain. One day we will be in a cemetery and someone will hopefully be talking about us. So it's part of creating a narrative and a chain of events that you can share and make easily relatable to other people. And especially as well with the, um, uh, the outbreak of COVID-19, cemeteries are experiencing a bit of a renaissance, not, not, not in terms of the fact that they're busier because of the unfortunate deaths and passings and so on, but they are an alternative to parks. I mean, I remember when a lockdown was first um, um, uh, announced in March, for example, there was uh, a great amount of uh, resistance to having them shut because people liked them because they were less busy and less packed than regular uh, parks and so on. So that's um, it's really reassuring to see that this time around for this second lockdown, people are actually uh, making use of cemeteries and kind of seeing that, you know, they're nice, they're quiet and they're a great way to kind of, again, leave the worries of the outside world behind us. So um, but when you go to a cemetery, what do you see? Well, obviously you headstones, you see tombs, you see all sorts of, um, you know, a particular kind of grave memorials and so on. This particular example that you can see on the, here, um, on the screen here is actually at the Buitenver Begrafplatz in Amsterdam. And it's a lovely cemetery. It's a contemporary of Kensal Green, although you wouldn't think it because it's um, because in the Netherlands and indeed in continental Europe, they have a slightly different relationship with cemeteries and the fact that many of these plots are on a leasehold basis. So it's almost like a, I suppose, a, a, a crass kind of um, a comparison would be to compare them to a museum. The, the exhibits or the people change because the plots are on a leasehold basis. So you have like all these old, so these ones are primarily from the 1920s, 1930s, and in the middle of them, not in this particular example, you can see modern headstones, which have kind of taken the place of the older ones when they've been removed. And as you can see on these particular headstones, you can see a name, a date of birth, a date of death, and that's largely, you might find the odd uh, biblical passage, you might find, you know, uh, um, like a, a, a short piece of poetry, um, but that's largely it. And frankly, uh, even as a cemetery enthusiast myself, I find that headstones don't, uh, don't really do a good job, particularly of telling the whole story. They give you the very bare minimum, of course, that's probably understandable. Headstones aren't particularly cheap, but wouldn't it be lovely if everyone's headstone could give them, you know, a more, rounded and uh, kind of a beneficial way of describing the people that are buried beneath them. And also as well, another thing to consider when you look at headstones, we always tend to look at the first names on them. We don't really kind of scale down, you know, and that's not to say that the people below the first name are any less important, but we just see a first name and then that's it. And then we, we kind of move on. Now, in terms of how I kind of try to change that, and how I try to read the headstones themselves, I use all various different kinds of media. I've done a symbols video for again, if you want kind of um, easily accessible content and trying to uh, show that headstones are not just about names and dates, they can also impart different uh, bits of symbolism and imageries. Uh, I did a video series uh, called uh, Graveyard Symbols, which I did with um, Eric Huang, um, who's known as Dino Boy 89 on Twitter. I've also done a number of YouTube videos around Beckenham Cemetery, primarily because um, I was going to do a tour around Beckenham Cemetery this year, but lockdown stopped me taking people around. So I just made it a digital series instead. And you can watch that on YouTube. There I'm talking about a Polish uh, scientist uh, called Cesaria Jed. Oh, I can't the pronunciation. always messed this up. Jedry Zawitzowka. I'm sorry if any of you are Polish. I've completely made a, a, a fool of myself saying that, but that, she's a fantastic scientist. And then obviously my website as well which I use basically as a as a way of chronicling the stories I find on the headstone. So kind of any bouncing between those three mediums um, and obviously my Twitter posts as well. That's how I 
uh, basically chronicle and write about the people that I find about. Now, when I said that headstones can be pretty rubbish, really, at telling you about the people beneath them, that's not always the case. There are some rare examples where the headstones actually goes above and beyond what you want to know about the information. I do wish that there were more headstones like this, although, of course, for various reasons, that's not always possible. This one in particular is the grave to Samuel Rabbath, and it is in Barnes Cemetery. Now, if any of you are familiar with London, Barnes is just, um, just south of Hammersmith Bridge. If you go all the way down Castle Law, it's just off a road called Rocks Lane, and it's this abandoned wild cemetery which uh, is now a part of, well, it, was, it was always on Barnes Common, but now nature has reclaimed it. So what was once a nice little prim and proper Victorian cemetery has now become essentially a grave in the wood. And that's why I call my tour there. And this headstone sticks out um, for many reasons, simply because this guy also has two memorials. He's um, also commemorated in Postman's Park. So if any of you are familiar with the city of London, you will probably be aware of the um the, like the tiles and and the way that the um, like uh, heroic stories from years gone by primarily because uh frederick watts the artist wanted to commemorate queen victoria's jubilee in 1897 by commemorating everyday acts of heroism rabath and a number of others have little plaques there but particularly on this particular one you've got his life story you know he was educated at king's college london he died on the in october 1884 because he was clearing the lungs of a young um, four-year-old diphtheria victim by the name of uh, Leon um, and basically to kind of clear his breathing. He just had an emergency tracheotomy and without kind of any filtration or any mouth guard, he put a, it was pretty grim, he put a um, like a hose down the poor boy's gullet here and sucked all the gunk out. And obviously he then ended up getting diphtheria himself. And when he died, he was regarded as a hero, but then there was also a lot of derision in the press as well as where people were going, what on earth was he thinking? We know it's highly contagious. We might not know exactly how it's transmitted, but that's, you know, it, it, it shouldn't have happened like that. So um, you've got this headstone, which is essentially, a, literally a eulogy to him and the fact that he died doing what he loved and, and that kind of stuff. But then with this kind of headstone as well, you do have to bear in mind that there is a slight bias to it because of course it's going to make him appear or you know for want of a better term holier than thou of course it's going to make him seem like he was so dedicated which there's no question that he was but also you have to realize that the bias there is that it will not say the other side of the story you know the fact that um newspapers of the time said that again it was a, it was a silly thing for him to do it wasn't really um on there was equipment that he could have used to kind of save his own life i mean and also the fact that the child was going to pass away anyway. So it was kind of like a fool's errand in a way. Of course, you know, as a, as a compassionate doctor, he wanted to ease the suffering and make sure that the person um, lived, or the little boy lived as long as possible. But again, so when you see headstones like that, you have to kind of bear in mind that they are, in an extent, a product of their time. They are written to the eulogizing Victorians who loved to show off and almost make an example of people who lived to that ideal, who were selfless in that way. Now, another way that um, is a good is a good one to kind of um, acknowledge, especially with with headstone histories as well, is that sometimes that they don't have headstones. If you go to most cemeteries, you'll see um, vacant plots, which aren't vacant at all. They're paupers' graves, people who weren't uh, rich enough to have headstones of their own. And those stories are the ones that I actually find the most interesting because they don't have the big memorials. They don't have the big showy, you know, big um, gothic spires or, or lovely kind of stone tombs with gorgeous pillars and stuff. These are people who are every day like you and me, but weren't able to have kind of headstones of their own. And so this guy here who recently has had a headstone installed about 10 years ago is a guy called John Buckley. And he's buried in a grave um, with several others who he never knew. And he's in, in, in the plot there that you can see uh, those um, servicemen, service women are standing on hundreds of people. and his headstone came about simply because he uh, was, and again, this is a, something, a subject that's very close to my heart because I am um, half Asian and half British, and he was served out in India. He was originally born in Staleybridge in Cheshire in 1813. And again, you know, you think he's in a cemetery um, in East London, in Tower Hamlet Cemetery, and you think about the global reach of these people. But he was uh, born in Staleybridge in 1813. He joined the East India Company in the 1830s. He was posted to Delhi and in the thing that gave him prominence was that he was defending the Delhi magazine in 1857. 
now 1857, a pretty integral year in British Indian relations when a number of Indian nationals wanted British rule to cease and stop and get out essentially. And Buckley himself was defending the Delhi magazine, which is, you know, stacked the rafters with kind of weaponry and goods uh, to enable East India Company and therefore British rule. And they couldn't let that fall into enemy hands. So they defended the garrison for, for a significant amount of time became overrun and they then detonated the magazine because they were left with no other choice. They're running out of morale and supplies and so on. Buckley here was uh, chucked 300 yards into the River Junma under enemy um, bullet fire, was um, captured, managed to escape, rounded up the um, individuals who were concerned and responsible for this, uh, you know, this kind of um, rebellion against British rule and then exacted a re-engineered form of Mughal execution, which was to strap people to cannons and then detonate them, to which he received the Victoria Cross. And that's how he got the headstone for that prominence. And when a, um, a researcher at the Tower Hamlet Cemetery was looking into his story, they thought, we well, know this should be commemorated. So whereas that's just one story, another kind of um, thing I want to raise in that thing is that he shares that grave with several others whose stories haven't warranted a headstone you know I, I can't remember the names off the top of my head but you know those individual stories they might not have served in India but they, you know those lives are just as important and when you're telling his story I always make a point and similar to William Blake as well actually if you go to Bunhill Fields he's got the headstone but then also there are other people in the grave with him who are just as worthy of the historical kind of prestige so whenever you're kind of talking about graves that are in a common um, kind of like common setting just you know, bear in mind as good manners as well as well as good practice to share their stories as well. Now, where to start when you do these kind of histories and, and stories? Now, as I said, the headstones give you some key dates. You know, you obviously need a name to get started. You need the uh, the birth, date of birth and death. My own personal thing is that so these are my kind of um, preferences here. I always start with Wikipedia, although I never solely rely on it. It's a good starting point, particularly if you're a historian and you want to look at lives who's um, who existed pre-internet. You know, again, you can't, you know, if you want to find out about the likes of John Buckley or whoever, you know, you can't just go on their Facebook profile. So you make a start with Wikipedia and then from there you kind of start the research from there. Look at the links that have been featured and then from those links, see what other stories are featured in there. Um, another good site, although not everyone has access to it, I do obviously because I've just finished being a student, is JSTOR, which has a remarkable amount of academic journals and so on that has some really good bits of information and stories that have been culled by various academics all over, you know, um, all over the world. The British Newspaper Archive, I sing the praises of because that's probably one of the chief uh, places where I find my information. Many of you who might be doing cemetery research or might be researching at all, or maybe just kind of looking on your phone very briefly, um, you'll see that if you go, you know, first stops usually a Wikipedia page, for example, you'll see that they give you like a rundown of, you know, birth, early life, latter life. Very rarely I find uh, is the place of burial mentioned or the end of life. That is very, very scantily touched on. So, um, you know, there's someone going to be touching on very presently a music hall performer by the name of Amy Height who was an American uh, black musical performer. And you know that in itself at the time, and if you consider music hall, 1900s and so on, incredible racism going on, but she was a very popular and very well-respected musical performer. But you, know, you will not find anywhere online that states where she's buried. It has a very brief uh, Wikipedia page and kind of one or two mentions with the odd sheet music cover on Google, but it never actually says where these stories end. So although you're in a cemetery where everyone's stories end, Sometimes if you're looking for a particular person, the information that you find to try and get that information isn't always readily available. So British newspaper archive, particularly obituaries and um, any kind of illustrations that are listed there is a great place to start to look as well. The Internet Archive as well, purely because of the amount of historical books. Again, being a lover of cemeteries, I'm certainly not the first. There have been many uh, Taffer files over the years who've looked into the history of a headstone. So many of the findings there have been recorded in books and journals, which have been digitised and are available to read in the Internet Archive, particularly with the likes of the British Library and so on being shut with this particular lockdown. It's a good, not completely as extensive, but it's a good place to try and go and find where you can find other stories that might be contemporary about the person who you're trying to research. Another one which is slightly unexpected is the Library of Congress, which is in the US. 
they seem to hoover up everything. Uh, I found everything from musical numbers to books about Addiscombe and Croydon. It's, um, again, it's, it's obviously just like a pool of information that's been digitised over the years from various government sources and so on that have just kind of washed up in America. So that's a really good place as well to kind of look to see where you can get additional information of, about the deceased from. And then Google as well. Again, it's not, it depends who you're looking for. The, the, the rich and the famous of yesteryear are probably going to have slightly more about them. But sometimes, you know, people like John Buckley or, or whoever might be in a common grave you're looking for, they might be listed in an old telephone directory or an old business listing that, you know, might be from the 1860s or what have you. So they're a good place. It's a good kind of indexing uh, thing to look at. And then as well, again, it's a subscription as well. Ancestry. Ancestry is really good because you've got all the census records. You've got uh, most of the military records. Uh, based there as well. You've got People's Family Tree Research who you can contact and see and have a discussion with about to work out what they found about it. And, you know, the amount of times I've spent on Ancestry with a glass of wine, just kind of, you know, literally getting lost in records, just trying to find, um, you know, just one bit of nugget of relevant information. I and mean, it's all good to, when you kind of go over it. Um, but looking at um, those kind of databases, those are my personal preferences. But of course, there's other kind of bits and pieces that I kind of pick up along the way as well. So things to look out for when you're looking at a headstone. Uh, look at the name. Is it rare or unusual? You can you can usually get the, uh, the sense of the person's uh, nationality from their headstone, uh, from their name even. And you can also obviously use their name to kind of go off into the archives and see what you can find. As I mentioned before, who else is in the grave? Don't just go for the first name listed, um, particularly on this one as well. This is something I feel very, very strongly about. Looking at cemetery history, um, it's predominant, even cemetery tools as well. It's very, very, very dominated by the white Victorian man. Now, that's not to say that no one else got buried or died. Of course, there's Georgian men as well. But primarily, if you go on particularly he um, historical tools as well, it always focuses on white Victorian men, which is fine. But I find that nowadays, particularly with um, gender equality and so on, I try to push for the stories of the wives, the daughters, the women, because those stories aren't as well represented in the archive, simply because, you know, it was very much a man's world in the past, of course. But whenever I see a headstone that says, um, like, Jane Bloggs, wife of Joe Bloggs, I, to a certain extent, dismiss Joe slightly, and I focus more on Jane because it's her story that I find infinitely more interesting. And it's those kind of micro histories that we should really be focusing on. So if you're uh, particularly, I'm, I'm sure a couple of you um, are volunteers in cemeteries and so on at the moment, if you're doing tours, again, the White Victorian Man story, that's fine. Of course, we shouldn't ignore that history, but do bear in mind as well the stories of the, of the women behind the men because I think those have been for too long overlooked, um, quite frankly. Now, um, contemporary images as well. Um, many of the, are, like if you look in any kind of um, historical cemetery, you'll find that there's usually, not always, but usually there are some um, contemporary images and photography of the cemetery at the time. For example, there's some really cracking images of Kensal Green Cemetery. Um, look at how that space was then. So if you look at, so I think there's one of Kensal Green where there's like um, one of the main avenue that looks down from the chapel right, that goes right down to the end of the cemetery. Look at that space as it is today. See how the monuments have changed. See how the names have been added or m monuments that have been replaced because subsequent members of the family have died and so on. So think about how that can infer the social standing of the family, how that can um, inform you about the, the, the status of the grave and the people buried beneath it and so on. And then also when you're, you're looking at the, the kind of um, the history of a headstone is that when was that headstone last visited by a mourner of that particular person? You are entering, although it's a public space, a very private space. So when you look at that, you know, think about when was the last time that flowers were last laid there? Who would have laid them? Why would they have laid them? And so on. So just kind of thinking like the wider context of not only just the biography of the person that's buried beneath, but the gap that that person left in the, in the, in the mourners' lives, essentially. Now, when it comes to grave research and stuff as well, there are two, uh, probably the best example I can find of, and I'm kind of slightly biased in this because I wrote for my masters about this, is that when you look at the diary of um, Anne Lister, which is now being um, turned into a very successful BBC TV show, Although her headstone in Halifax, I think, was recent, uh, was fairly recently rediscovered. Um, her story is again 
a tale from a tomb, although you've got the diary, but obviously her headstone has now become a place of pilgrimage in itself. And you've got to think about when you're researching a headstone. And again, I have come across this and I'm certainly not kind of naming names or anything, but when you're doing cemetery research, particularly, ownership of that person's biography, particularly if you're the one who's done the research, it can be a little bit, how, to, how, how can I say it? It's that there people sometimes feel that they own the person that they're researching. And so therefore when information needs to be shared, it's not particularly forthcoming. And you know what, I, I admit it, I've, I've been guilty of that particular thing myself. You get so invested in the life of the person that you're researching that, you know, the, the fact that someone says, oh, I'm researching this person as well, what have you found? And you kind of, you know, kind of clutch your pearls and go, oh, well, you know, I've, I've, kind of, I've kind of done all this work myself. But that's, that's a silly thing because this person never knew you. You don't own their life. So if anything, you know, by all means, share your passion, which is what I, which is what I try to do. I try to instill my enthusiasm for finding out about someone. Um, and so, for, you know, for someone like Helena Whitbread, for example, who, who kind of transcribes um, Anne Lister's diaries. Now, her work is allowing other people to step into her world and to kind of see what else they can analyze about Anne Lister. And particularly in my um, example, uh, there's a Victorian diary by um, a guy called Nathaniel Bryson. And you can read it online, it's freely available. He is a chap who wrote a diary throughout his life. He died in the early 1900s, but the volume that survives um, out of his entire life is the one he kept as a 19 year old in 1846. And I've loved this diary for years because it gives such a fascinating insight, not only into a slightly eccentric 19 year olds kind of uh, goings and going abouts and what he got up to on a daily basis, you know, like he'll, he'll go to, St Paul's Cathedral you know you know when you go to St Paul's Cathedral you're almost stepping in his footsteps and it goes on to detail his uh, relationships with women particularly his girlfriend who was 50 years old compared to his 19 and so on and when I um, started looking into him I've kind of I've done a couple of audio podcasts for him through Westminster libraries um, I also did a museum show off based about him and then when I went to his grave to see that headstone, as you can see me there, I've actually got a copy of his diary that I've printed out, and that's his actual headstone, which he's buried beneath. Again, he's not the first person buried there. The first name listed there is his wife, Sarah, who predeceased him by some years. It's, um, you know, I, I kind of want to share his story in a manner that he would have shared his own life story were he, were he alive. So it's not about, you know, never mind all the research I've done, it's kind of wanting to share that enthusiasm that I have for that person as well. Now, one of the big things about uh, doing headstone research is storytelling. You, it's all very well getting the names and dates and, you know, this person sailed to New York or this person created a type of rubber or, or whatever it might be. But it's about how you use that information and try and engage other people with it and how to make it interesting so that you briefly resurrect them. Now, well, you can't fully resurrect them, of course. I mean, that would be incredibly gruesome. But in terms of trying to give, you, give them a give the person you're talking about a sense of a renaissance, you know, to try and give them, a, a, give the audience or whoever you're talking to or writing about, you're trying to engage with that audience about how you can make that person almost, you know, as if they're in the room with you, as if you're trying to do a, a good stab, essentially, at trying to, to kind of create their lives. And I find by being slightly theatrical and trying to indulge in slightly different on oral story technology, uh, oral storytelling techniques, it's a fantastic way of um, basically sharing someone's life. Now, of course, I'm biased in this, I'm a tour guide. This is what I do on, a, on, a, on an almost daily basis. So when I was, um, when we were talking about um, the, the queer dead of Brompton Cemetery, for example, we wanted it to be more than just a regular tour. So what we ended up doing is that we um, recruited a number of um, poets and storytellers. And as you can see on the screen here, we recruited a drag queen by the name of Virgin Extravaganza to highlight the lives of those buried here. Now, this is almost like blunt force trauma in a way in that the queer lives of the cemetery and those particularly that are buried beneath the stones weren't able to live their own truth and their own lifetime because obviously um, like homosexuality was only legalized in the 1960s. So you have the likes of um, Charles Alston Collins who was the son-in-law of Charles Dickens who was probably gay, Although we use those terms, like, like terms like um, homosexual and, and bisexual didn't exist back then. So we have to be careful when we're talking about those, those kind of um, instances. But using like modern people today, be it virgin extravaganza or storytellers and poets and so on, trying to almost undo the fact that they live their lives in the shadows and literally proclaiming almost 
that they lived a life and we should know about them. So by doing it in a way that is respectful, of course, always has to be respectful and engaging and so on, um, by trying to be as open as possible and by trying to giving a sense of, you know, they're here, this, we as a modern day representative of these people are trying to do the very best by their own history and so on. So in terms of um, headstones kind of leading, I've already touched on uh, Miss Amy Hype, for example, here she is uh, doing her music hall number, uh, De Tennessee Christening, again, if I, I found out yesterday that she's buried in Stretton Vale Cemetery, whether she has a headstone, I'm not entirely sure. I was actually going to have a look, but then this lockdown was announced. So I've kind of been unable to kind of go and see this, the spot where she's allegedly buried myself. And then um, looking at another minority history, which is, again, something I really do kind of push when you're looking at the history of a headstone. Looking for those stories that aren't regularly told. Again, the the anticlimax, anti the the um, antithesis of the white Victorian male. Looking at the stories that aren't particularly shared. So here um, on the um, the uppermost image is the grave of a guy called uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sidney Douglas Rumbold, who was a First World War lieutenant. And I came across his grave by accident. I found a little like um, a laminated A4 sheet of paper, which uh, a modern day descendant had obviously left. And his prominence was that he was essentially a, a, um, a military uh, war hero, but he was caught uh, in the billet doing something he probably shouldn't have been, well, so he shouldn't have been doing. He was caught in a compromising permission, a position. Now, exactly what this position was, I'm not entirely sure. I can, as a gay man, I can probably work out what was going on, but he was stripped of his medals and the prestige he had as a model soldier was removed quite unceremon unceremoniously from him. And he lived the rest of his life basically living under a shadow from the fact that he disgraced the, the, the British army by indulging in such acts. And here I am with the volunteers of uh, Lady Well and Broccoli Cemetery where there are actually uh, moves afoot now to put a new headstone in uh, his place to bring his story to life to the modern uh, queer audience because although in life and indeed in death for a number of years his story was, was kind of seen under a cloud and, and not something that perhaps should have been celebrated. Now we can celebrate him and his story should be rightly known. And yeah, so that, that kind of thing as well, that again, I'm, I'm pretty kind of um, big on in regards to trying to kind of big up those alternative histories. Now, history um, from the headstones is done really well by, by various uh, people. Obviously I'm gonna big up myself, um, you know, it's, it's my passion, but there are other notable people who do a, a supremely good job at kind of analysing a headstone and what you can take away from it. Shout out to Sam Perrin at Abney Park, who is a formidable um, historian. She's an amazing cemetery enthusiast and her tours are pretty good. Glasnevin Cemetery, for example, as well, they do uh, remarkable work in also championing the way that I look at cemeteries, which is looking at cemeteries of museums of people. They do engaging um, history tours, as well as a pretty strong heritage um, outreach center and a number of projects as well to kind of get, kind of marry up the gap between the living and the dead. There's Wilsdon Jewish Cemetery, which has recently uh, been awarded heritage lottery funding. And again, they themselves are marketing themselves almost as like a, a museum of people essentially and trying to kind of open up um, the stories that are buried within in, in amazing um, kind of engagement and heritage outreach uh, positions. And then Arnold's Vale Cemetery as well, which is uh, pretty good at involving the local community and getting people in, on board to kind of relearn and reacquaint themselves with lo the local dead. So that's basically, if I can go back, uh, that's basically um, my kind of way how I look at headstones questions. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much um, for that, Sheldon. That's um, been brilliant. There's been loads of comments come in. I'm just going to stop your screen share at the moment. Um, yeah. As Sheldon just said there, everyone, we're about to go into question time. But before we do that, I just want to pick up on a couple of points that Sheldon mentioned. Um, you'll see in our um, feed there, we've posted links to Holy Trinity York. Now, that's a really important church. Not only is it in our care and protection, but that is the church where Anne Lister um, sealed her union. And when BBC um, filmed Gentleman Jack, they actually came and filmed in our church. So not only, you know, did she do it in life, but actually the BBC latest series actually captured that beautifully. So there's some really amazing stories um, in our collection. 
what and what you said there about um you know where people don't have grave shield and i think that's really important and thank you for giving us those tools um if anyone has read alan bennett's lady in the van um play or been to see or in the theater or seen the film um you know when mary shepherd um i think her real name in life was um, um margaret fairwright um she was buried in saint pancras and islington cemetery in an unmarked grave so it really is important to actually look at those sources of history and what they can tell us about life but some would probably argue that she's been immortalized by alan bennett which probably is going to be a, a a nicer memorial to have really so we're going to dive into question time now um so our first question we've got here sheldon is um you talked, I think it was that when you were in Austria, um, you talked about some of the graves um, there and sort of how they treat graves slightly differently on the continent with leaseholding. Um, mm. Do they remove the bodies when the lease is up or just take away the headstones? So that's a that's a really good question. So yeah, it's in the so in the Netherlands. Um, I mean, I, it, that's one of the benefits of having being in a long distance relationship. It kind of exposed me to a, a, a cemetery abroad, which is just brilliant. So the way that it works there, in my understanding is that a, a plot is bought on either a ten, a twenty, or a thirty year lease, which can be extended. Um, usually at the end of every kind of um, period, the, the family gets a notification to say this grave is basically up for renewal. What would you like to happen to it? If it's not renewed, the person is exhumed and they are, and I believe their bones are then placed into a huge kind of like catacomb, ossuary kind of uh, setup. So then the plot that they're originally in is then uh, available for reuse by a more recent burial. Thanks, Sharon. And how common is it that graves are listed if there are no um, headstones? If graves are listed if there's no headstones i'm not sure I, that's a good point i'm not sure if a grave can be listed if there's no headstone per se um i think i mean again in my experience i think when there's a person of note beneath it usually it's found by a community group or perhaps like a friends association and they usually bang the drum rightfully so to recognize the person beneath it and then there's various various ways that that can be done in the form that john buckley's took where the um uh, the cemetery volunteer actually approached his modern day regiment and said, hello, you've got, we've got this alumni of yours that we think should be remembered and acknowledged, not particularly celebrated, particularly in his case, because again, he, he did some, you know, some, some questionable things under, under a modern lens. Um, but yeah, it, it, it depends. I think as long as the, the interest is there and there are people who want to celebrate those buried beneath it, the erection of a headstone is probably the, the, the place to get started and then just kind of take it from there. Thanks, John. And uh, on the same similar theme with headstones, when did headstones become normal um, for uh, and uh, this person for ordinary people? But um, before then, was it just a case that wooden crosses would be used that would have just rotted away over time? I think it. Uh, it, it, it I mean, headstone, headstones themselves have been used for, for thousands of years. I mean, you know, you can if you go to somewhere like the the Petri, not you can at the moment. You go to like the Petri Museum, you can see Egyptian steles. Um, and you, you know they, they existed in ancient Greece and so on. They, the lives have always been commemorated in stone in one form or another. Whether they were rich enough to afford a headstone of their own, that's obviously another matter in, in, in entirety. Some people would prefer to choose the, the wooden cross for sure. Um, it depends. It, de it depends entirely on the family and what, what they kind of wanted to happen uh, basically. But yeah, if, if they didn't have a headstone, uh, but then I mean, here's another point I probably should have uh, raised an unmarked graves. Many of the people buried in um, unmarked graves, for example, um, do have little headstones, but it's literally they are like tiny little things because that's all they could afford. So particularly go to Tower Hamlets and where was I earlier um, yesterday? I went to uh, Putney Lower Cemetery on the Common. You've got these tiny little headstones that they don't commemorate every single person in the grave, but the families, if they could scrape a couple of pence together or a couple of pounds and shillings, they they used to kind of just commemorate them in that way as well. That's really interesting. And um, some, you know, you've, you've given some really fantastic historical sources and some great books that people should read. Someone's asked a question here. Um, are you familiar with John Price's wonderfully researched book, Heroes of Postman's Park? Yes, it's a fantastic book. I think it, really, it originally started life as an app because I think from, I remember talking to him about him about it when it was first unveiled, um, because again, you know, you have these um, headstones and, you know, th this is something else that cemeteries are beginning to do as well. They're kind of looking at digital offering. I mean, Arlington Cemetery, for example, has a pretty robust app that looks at the, um, you know, the people that are buried there and you like, you click on like a little location and a biography pops up. So 
in terms of what John Price did with Postman's Park is actually but lovely memorials that to most people they've kind of lost that that immediate connection with because you know you see you know so, um, you know so and so saved uh, so and so from a, from a, a drowning or you know ran into a burning building you know that's great but in terms of who that person was the, where they were born how they lived what they did for a living you know that even you know their their favorite song or the you know their their favorite item of clothing um, it's it's kind of things like that like John Price's book particularly in that instance that really do a good kind of resurrection essentially. Brilliant. Thanks Sean and um, we're going on to um, so, still connected with headstones in some ways but um, what is your opinion on the marking of the first or in some cases the last grave in a churchyard or cemetery? Uh, what was that question? Um, what is your opinion on the marking of the first or in some cases last grave in a churchyard or cemetery? Oh is it like the first burial and then the last burial? I think it's um, I don't put too much I don't put too much impetus on it. Um, I, you know, obviously there's there's a first and a last person, but it's kind of it's kind of a weird accolade to kind of put on someone's memory. You know, oh, you know, this person was the first person buried here. I mean, I mean that 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 to that person that wouldn't have been of any particular use um, in the fact that you know obviously it's a title that was bestowed on them after they died. It's important though because you can use them as case studies. So uh, again, again, kind of using Tao Hamlets, which is kind of my little, uh, my favourite at the moment. You've got Walter Gray, who was the first one. Uh, he was the first chap. And then if you paraphrase him with the last burial that happened in Tao Hamlets in 1966, I think it was a, a, a lady in the 80s, I think. I'll have to check. You can, you, you can almost like do a comparison and say, you know, how, how, how were their lives and how was the local area in which they lived? How is it different? So you can use it as kind of like a framing device for sure, but I wouldn't put too much kind of emphasis on it. And that's kind of, yeah, thanks for that, Sheldon. Um, on to, um, this is more about modern trends and how historians maybe in a hundred years time might look back on, but with the um, growing sort of, you know, the, how graves themselves are becoming, you know, harder to um, attain, they're becoming more expensive, more people are going for cremations. Yep. Does this present a challenge for future historians when trying to research, um, you, know, our, you know, our legacies and who people were? It's, yeah, I mean, you know, as an, by extension, this question kind of does kind of make me reflect on how I'm probably going to end up, you know, am I going to be able to afford my own plot? Probably not, because it's not cheap. Cremation is a far, you know, um, more environmentally friendly, although it's, you know, that, that could be kind of used in quotation marks. But yeah, in terms of whereas, you know, we now have these almost like outdoor indexes of, of cemeteries and graveyards where we can look at you know, a former tobacconist who used to work in Manchester or, or whatever. Yeah, as you say, you know, when, when our own time comes, most of us will either be scattered or we'll just have like small little plaques. And that's not to uh, mention the fact that many of the cemeteries that we'll end up in will become full themselves and might, you know, become decrepit and vandalised and so on. So it's, 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 a, it's a difficult question to answer because we just don't know what it's going to be. Like, will we have the internet in 100 years, for example? You have all these like, um, you know, um, these memorial pages or, or Facebook memorializations or, you know, will my Twitter page in 100 years still be visible? If it is, I dare say there will be a more online form of commemoration and remembrance. But I mean, again, who knows? I mean, you know, the, the world's topsy turvy enough as it is at the moment. Who knows how that will eventually pan out? So, yeah, potentially, you know, it, it, there could be like a gap. I, the kind of um, situation I kind of liken it to is that, Back in the old days, you know, when you went on holiday and you used to take um, photos of like your trips abroad. Well, now I take, you know, photos on my phone. And that's when was the last time I had any photos developed? If my phone was to get wiped or deleted, I've lost those memories. They're gone. But my, my parents' trips to Italy and so on, they're still around. We still have those. So I wonder in terms of our own memory, particularly, say, of, of my and, and, and later generations who live online, if that was to suddenly go, will there suddenly be a gap? So I don't know. It's it's a that's an, that's an intriguing question. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. And if you could afford a grave, what would your headstone say? Headstone? I'd have an entire whacking mausoleum. <laughs> I am I am very open about this. I would have a big Greek mausoleum with arms holding lanterns, like in the films in the 1920s. Uh, you could walk in. There'd be an espresso machine, and then in like in the in the crypt, there'd be like a little kind of like little museum thing. I oh yeah yeah. I mean, are you surprised, George? Really? Me? Come on. I think that's brilliant. Um, 
I, th I think this is a really interesting. One. So what, you know, obviously you've done loads of research in cemeteries um, across the country, but what was the most surprising or most intriguing, intriguing grave or headstone that you've come across? Oh, that's not asking what my favourite child is. Um, oh, God, my, the most intriguing. I would probably say, oh, now there's a question. I would probably say Buckley. I would probably say Buckley, but Buckley's a, a he's a personal favourite of mine because of, of, the, of the duality of him and the, the fact that the one thing that fascinates me about his particular story is that, again, disregard the headstone for a moment, beneath me, six, seven, eight foot, however deep he is, is someone who once went to India. Now, again, you know, you think of you think of a, of a corpse or as a body as a stationary object now. Um, and to think that he saw such things and did such things I just find extra and again you know it, it, I dare say there's probably in the plot next to him that's, that did something just as wondrous but for me the kind of the thing that blew my mind particularly when I was researching him was like wow wow that's pretty impressive so yeah I'd probably say yeah Buckley for, for, sure, for sure. And when people are sort of looking into um, sort of um, a particularly um, those um, military graves where people are being um, awarded medals. Um, where's the best way of, or what's the best way for them to find out um, the backgrounds of the World War One, or, or particularly World War One medals they may have won? Oh, no, there's a question. I, my way of doing it is if people have social media, ingratiate yourself with military historians and so on. Um, particularly in my case, I, I don't profess to be any kind of military specialist at all. I know obviously about the First World War, I know, you know, people have researched people who fought it and so on. But my, my way is that, you know, you kind of utilize and build your own network. So as a tour guide, I've got people who I can rely on to say, okay, I'm doing this First World War piece. Could you just fill me on, on this little uh, piece of information? So I would say it's a great way to network and socialize, reach out to military historians if you know them on Twitter. In my case, Andy Locke, uh, he's pretty good. Biggest Andy on Twitter. He's fantastic. Um, yeah, just, you kind of just play to people's strengths. Brilliant. Um, and we're going into, um, again, sort of a, a, about modern trends in some ways. Um, but someone's here has asked about when did the difference between, you know, what, what really marks a cemetery out from a churchyard? Um, and is there a reason why people might want to be buried in a churchyard as opposed to a cemetery today? Uh, well, there's yeah, there's, so the, the the distinction it, it can be it's it's not immediately obvious. So from my understanding of it, a churchyard has a church connected to it. A cemetery does not have a church. It's it, usually it's sometimes, but not always, extramural, as in it's outside of the city bounds. Of course, now what with urban development and urban sprawl, that is not the case most of the time. Many people, however, like to be buried in churchyards because it's a slightly more intimate place to be buried. It's obviously um, closer to where they may have worshipped in life. And it's got there is the quaintness and the imagery of, a, of an old English churchyard, particularly with the yew tree symbolism and so on, that people just find generally appealing and probably a little bit more personable than, say, a cemetery, which can be quite vast, huge spaces and can be quite intimidating, particularly if not only if you're a mourner, but also if you're a researcher as well. And I think that's a really, um, really good point to sort of say to everyone watching that if, you know, during lockdown, you want to go out for walks anywhere, do go onto our website, which is visitchurch.org.uk and find a church near you. Um, because many of our churches have, um, as we've you know, been discussing here, some wonderful, wonderful churchyards with them. Not all of them, but a good deal of them do. And, you know, just look at those churchyards and look at what those memorials say um, in the um, the thumbnail for this um, lecture, you'll have seen um, a beautiful angel um, sculpture memorial, and that's from the Church of St. George's at Portland. Now that cemetery alone has over two and a half thousand gravestones and memorials in it. Um, we've got graves to people killed by uh, murderers. We've got pirates, we've got adventurers. So, you know, as Sheldon said, you know, graves do tell a story and that they're of our ancestors, they belong to everyone. Um, you know, the same goes for our church buildings, our churchyard. So, you know, if you find yourself with something wanting to do in lockdown um, and you want to go out for a walk near you, do go to a church, um, you know, particularly one of our churches and get exploring. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions, Sheldon. So um, we're going to go away from human headstones here, but what about headstones dedicated to pets or non-human beings? Ah, yeah, there's some cracking examples. Uh, there's obviously the Hyde Park Pet Cemetery, which I don't think has had any recent burials in it, but it's always very popular. Um, you know, there's an Atlas Obscura article about it. Um, people have kind of visited it. Uh, there's a, a blog uh, by Caroline Swan, uh, which she runs called Flickering Lamps 
which looks at the history of the Hyde Park Pet Cemetery. There's another, I've only ever come across one other example personally, and that's in Pancras and Islington Cemetery. Um, and there is a, a, a sizable plot where you've got a cockatiel that's buried next to a, a Rottweiler. So you know, you've got this, this, you know, this, it's really lovely that, 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 and it obviously says a lot about us as a nation of animal lovers, that we invest so much in the memory of our pets, as well as deceased family members and so on. Thanks, John. And I think um, for one final question here, I think uh, we're going to come back to London and look at some of the London cemeteries, but were notable people treated differently to as opposed to the masses with the 19th century burials from London to Brookwood? Yeah, they having the having the rich and wealthy on board obviously helped the fortune of a cemetery because many cemeteries wanted to have big imposing memorials, particularly cl uh, clustered close to their entrances or in Brookwood's case, kind of in the immediate vicinity of where the stations are because it, it gives off a good vibe, essentially. You know, if you go to a cemetery and literally there's like one headstone and that's it, then it doesn't really give off a sense that number one, the cemetery is particularly successful or that it's a particularly desirable place to want to be buried. So the Victorians were all about showing off in death for, you know, and that, that's, that explains why if you go to places like Highgate or or uh, Kensal Green or West Norwood, which were the places to be buried, you'll see all those fancy kind of headstones and tombs and so on, because they're, they're trying to show off in death as much as they probably tried to do in life as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very much a case of trying to, you know, yeah, just big themselves up really and, and leave a lasting legacy. So, it, in, you know, in Brookwood as well, because that was seen as the, the satellite cemetery of, of London, having it in a properly idyllic garden cemetery kind of um, set up, it, it, just, it, it just looked nice. It looked great. And it, it kind of it, it ate into an ideal that, you know, this was a respectable place to be buried, which many of the people's ancestors, be they had they big headstones or not beforehand, probably weren't able to have access to if they were buried in the local parish churchyard in years gone by. Well, thank you, Sheldon, for your answering those questions, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. Do keep them coming. We'll be commenting and trying to answer them as best we can. Um, again, thank you, Sheldon, for taking the time to talk today. Now, next week, everyone, we're going to be joined by, um, um, sorry, I'm just going to say it right, Kirsty Hartsitosis. Now, Kirsty is going to be talking to us about memorials of these of these dark days and that is looking at war, World War I memorials um, in the Cotswolds um, that were designed and constructed in the arts and crafts style. So do join us for that lecture there. There is um, more information about that lecture on our Facebook page or on our website. Now as we said at the start of this lecture these lectures are completely free. Um, we've recorded this, all of our lectures are recorded and you can catch up on any of them at any time for free either on our Facebook playlist or our YouTube channel. There is links to our Facebook playlist um, in the bio. But please, everyone, if you do like these lectures, you want to continue doing them, please do consider supporting us um, by making a donation towards our work. As I said, you can donate £3 um, by texting CCT to 70331. You can donate £10 to us by texting again CCT to 70191. Now, you can also donate through our website, or as we said, you can get a free copy of Matthew Burns' Beautiful Churches book if you join us as a member by direct debit from as little as £3.50 a month. Now, again, there's details for how to join us as a member on our um, Facebook page and in the comment box below. But if you've got any questions, um, any feedback for us, any ideas for future lectures you want us to sort out for you, comment away, send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. But again, thank you everyone for joining us for another Thursday lunchtime lecture. Thank you to Sheldon. And we look forward to seeing everybody next week for our next week's lecture. Take care, everyone. <laughs>